join me as we learn about mineral, air, water, and subsurface rights. You will see these on examinations, but more importantly, you'll see these in practice. Let's talk about these types of rights that are bundled in with the purchase of real property. And that's coming up next. All right, so outside of the land itself, when we're buying real property, uh, we need to have an understanding of the other elements that are connected to the land. For example, we need to know a little bit about the air above. What can we do with it? How valuable is it potentially? Consider for a second that the air above your property in an urban environment, for example, could be exceptionally valuable. All right, and we see air rights transactions happening all over cities across the United States. All right, so let's get into the actual different types of rights. The first one is fairly straightforward, and these are called surface rights. All right, so they're pretty straight up. Surface rights are when the buyer gets surface rights. With these, the landowner can do sort of whatever is deemed legal in terms of land development and construction of things like new structures and buildings. The rights even postulate, as a matter of fact, that they can make physical improvements in the predetermined area. This includes things like planting crops and things of that nature. If the owner wants to provide their neighbor things like easements across their land, they can also do that, all right? The next set of rights is something called mineral or subsurface rights. So similar to surface rights, this set of rights gives the owner the right to use the area below their property. If they want the subsurface easements or some space for things like sewer lines, the owner can do this. This is provided that both parties will undergo due process to complete the transaction. This is a set of rights that also allows the owner to take minerals directly below the property. The same is applicable for gas and oil found below. If they prefer, they can even lease this to companies that need the resources. The next type are air rights. A real estate owner has unlimited ownership of the air above their building. This is provided that the structures that the owner builds will not obstruct air traffic. If that person has a two-story building on the property bought, then they can build three more stories on top of that by virtue of air rights. Otherwise, they can have air rights to someone else and they can build additional items as well. All right, the next one are water rights. Now, water rights are important for real estate examinations. They always come up. If the property in question is located beside a body of water, the buyer will more likely than not have a specific rights related to them. While that scope of rights may differ from one area to another, they tend to have similar qualities and characteristics. If you're doubtful about the scope of water rights, it's always best to consult an attorney based in the area in which the real estate is located. These lawyers will help shed some light on the ambiguous areas of the law and establish water rights as a fundamental along. Now, the basic ones are things like repairing rights, navigable streams that are owned by the state, navigable ones that are owned by the buyer until a certain body or line in the water happens. Then we have littoral rights, which are adjacent to bays and oceans and things of that nature. The government owns the rest of the water after we get out past the high water mark. For agricultural areas with low water supplies, the government can generally decide who gets control of the water resources, and we sometimes call those the doctrine of prior appropriation. All right, so water rights, air rights, surface rights, subsurface rights, these are all items that are very important in practice, obviously, and on real estate examinations. My bet is that you might see water rights as a standout on most real estate exams. So remember, things like riparian, littoral, doctrine of prior appropriation, and the ownership as it extends if the waterway is navigable or non-navigable. All right, hopefully that sheds some light on the things that you typically see in this particular topic, and I look forward to seeing y'all in the next one.